Leon mentioned, I'll just slowly go into the topic. So again, I've asked um, our two friends here if anybody is from the industry. So anybody else not from the industry? So just in public. So okay, I will just take you through very briefly uh, that what's been happening in the technology space today in virtual reality. Um, and I'll keep it as broad as I can. Uh, but I think most importantly, some so our friend here is recording, so this is serious stuff here. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> uh, okay, um, old friends, I need to repeat this because there are like new friends coming in. <coughs> Anybody from the industry? In films and okay, yourself. Uh, you, you freelance or okay? In camera department, what department? Great, great. Okay. So I just wanted to get a sense uh, from everyone here today. So, so because just I just needed to know how deeply I should go into things. So, anyways, again to repeat, I'm I'm gonna keep it as broad as I can. Uh, but I think most most useful, I would say is the landscape today in, in VR, VR as virtual reality, and how you can kind of capitalize this technology into applying to the work that you are doing. So be it across the industry, then you can kind of think about it, you know, after this talk, hopefully you, you will, you know, come up with some questions. Um, and most importantly is to kind of push the boundaries a little bit in terms of um, what I can do more um, just leveraging off the current um, landscape of technology today. So, anyways, um, let me quickly go to the other side. So, very, very simple. VR or virtual reality is actually, you know, think of think of it as you being um, in a place somewhere else, but you're not physically there. So, virtual reality is not quite real, but it immerses you into that situation or that place that you are in. So a very good example is um, in uh, tourism, for example. So typically now, virtual rea reality, you can approach it and you can consume it with what they call a HMD, which is a head-mounted display. You can come in, new friend. Um, so hey man, this way, as I think you have seen it around in exhibition Orchard Road or, or some parts in Singapore. You wear the headgear and you kind of immerse in it. Immerse in it, so how do you do that is from the content in your headgear. So if any questions at all, please feel free to interrupt me so I hope that I'm not going too fast. So virtual reality again, uh, it transports you into somewhere else. Uh, so when you wear the head-mounted display, so if the content is showing you, say for example, in Sydney, right? So it takes you there in terms of how it immerses you in Sydney. So you feel like you are in Sydney and experience, experiencing the things that are happening around you, depending on what is being uh, shot or created in part of the content. So very loosely use virtual reality, then the second one is called augmented reality. So I'm not sure if you've heard of augmented reality or AR. So augmented reality is a little bit different um, from VR. AR is they use technology to computer generate particles or elements in the real world. Right? So you and I sitting here today, so I use AR, I can literally just create camera stands Video, video capture tables, but they are not real. So they are being projected from, say, elements that are third party. So it could be that projector projecting out all these things that you feel is real in the real world, but they are actually just computer generated. So then extending it a little bit further, sorry, not being all too boring here, but it's called mixed reality, which is um, a little bit more cheap. So mixed reality is the com combination of the best of both worlds. So mixed reality is, you, you can think about it as VR plus AR. So you combine these two realms together, that's what you get, mixed reality. So mixed reality, well by definition it means that you know you combine you being in a virtual world, being projected, you know there are projections that are computer generated, but the difference is in real time. 
So I could be talking to our friend here, but we are, we are now in Sydney. At the same time, you know, there are people walking out from the wall. So these are computer generated augmented reality. So anything that augments your reality but places you in the real world, that's mixed reality. So, um, so very quickly, I just wanted to show you this chart, which I thought was very useful when I first started up. I just remember I forgot to introduce myself by time. Uh, so this is a landscape which I thought was very interesting. Uh, as you can see, right, uh, so ignore the arrows over here. So maybe we could start on the right hand side first. All these are content that are created. So when I mention content that are created, it could be, remember this time I mentioned when you watch something in the head mounted display or the VR goggles we, we call it. Inside, it is a content that has been shot produced, created before, you know, be it photography or be it using a, a, a video camera that has been, you know, uh, modified to capture 360 environment. 360 means, you know, if I put the camera here, I literally can shoot the entire room. So that will enable the consumer when I'm wearing the VR head here to kind of look in front, to the left, right and to the back as well. Okay, so all this content are then fed into the software. Of course, then we're going to do what we call post-production work on it. Um, in terms of, for example, putting special effects in it, putting music, putting sound, kind of making the graphics better. Um, and then what will happen is, of course, how consumer, that little figure there will consume it again, is the head-mounted display, which is the VR goggle at the moment. So besides VR goggles that you can kind of consume these contents now, you can also use your mobile phones and you can also use your desktop or your computer or even your smart TV these days. Well, how you can kind of explore if it's 360 or not is if it's a mobile phone, you can kind of like, you know, move it around, right? But for your laptop, you can use your cursor or your mouse to kind of drag, say what is behind this girl, you know, then you can kind of drag and see what's behind. So, I mean, I hope I'm not going too fast, but do you guys have any questions before I move on? Can hear me okay, right, on the back? Okay, great. And if it's very boring, you can say it's very boring too, okay? So I will try to spice things up a little bit, but this is as far that I can go, like, in terms of spicing things. Okay, um, something again, quite interesting. Um, so why all this talk about VR, AR, mixed MR these days, MR is mixed reality. Why sudden why there is this sudden conversation or sudden boom or interest, you know? Why there's this talk that's happening or or like so many companies now is shooting 360 VR content? Why is Discovery Channel, you know, creating their own apps to store all their bespoke content? So why now? The big question, right? But if you look into the history, uh, VR has already been invented 30 years ago. So the big question is why has the technology only started to boom early last year and why is it being projected to such crazy uh, revenue amounts in the years to come? Um, then this is something which I thought, again, very interesting, which may not be very interesting to you, is mobile penetration rate. So mobile penetration rate has spiked in recent years as you know everyone is on smartphones so i mean to give you a little bit of a figure just how big it is just in asia alone mobile penetration rate is over one billion you know we're talking about everyone is on smartphones now for vr consumption is on smartphones so when of course all these devices and all these consumers started to consume uh, their mobile phones be it, you know going online going on social media, that's when then the VR boom cycle starts. Because it's the only way that people can consume VR at the moment, which is mobile phones. So it's kind of like a supply and demand thing, right? Because if you're talking about 30 years back, who was using mobile phones? Everybody was using the Motorola, the brick, right? And the brick, you cannot consume anything. You can literally just dial, you know, and or like hit people with it. Um, so, I mean, this is just a timeline to let you see you know, VR has actually been around for the longest time. It's only these few years that it started to gain some traction. It's because 
of our lifestyle today and of course you know as we consume more mobile phones these people are producing more 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 of such devices now something that would jump up that would be quite um, interesting is it's starting to about two years back or a year and a half back it really the cycle really started when Facebook bought Oculus because Oculus actually has been around for the longest time they have been making these headgears but it's just that they have nothing to feed it into you know so you have all these headgears but you have nothing to to complement it for people to consume so when all this happens then that's when you know, all these companies start to realize the potential of it. You know, it is very unlikely in the years to come that people will not use mobile phones. So that is how this whole boom started. Very different from 3D, by the way. So 3D, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard. Like over the years, there are 3D movies that you can go and watch in the cinema. But it's not a lot. Like nobody is talking about 3D, right? Why? It's because it's very difficult to consume 3D. You can only go and watch a 3D film when you know you have to wear that glasses. And where can you watch it? You can only watch it in the cinema or at home with a 3D TV, right? And on top of that, it's actually very expensive to shoot 3D as well. Shoot is as in like capture 3D. So um Again, supply demand, so when VR expectation took off, uh, all these cameras started to be produced to make VR, right? So as the, the more volume there are, all these cameras started coming out with cameras that can capture VR, of course there will be more consumption. So again, chicken and egg, right? Your, cons your, your, your consumption and your supply is always a chicken and egg thing. So this is the interesting part, I thought, uh, that you can kind of hopefully take away how, what is VR, what is AR, and what is mixed reality moving forward, and you know, kind of apply to the things that you are doing, be it uh, when you're working, be it if you're in education now or still studying, you know, because it's actually very highly relevant across industries. So I mean, who is in gaming here? Nobody. Okay. Um, so, so anyone fit into any of these industries here? I'm not sure about what. Or too shy to say. Okay. <laughs> so, anyways, right now there are nine target markets or nine markets that are quite, quite famous um, for VR. Like you can, you can, you can literally just see VR being applied in all these nine industries perpetually. So for example, one of course is gaming, right? So VR enhances the place that we are in now. So it enhances the experience. And of course, the first thing that pops up that becomes very popular um, in terms of VR application is in gaming. So now imagine if you're playing Resident Evil or, or if you're playing Star Wars in the battleship, right? Instead of you as a third party person, you know, playing Xbox or PlayStation, just facing the, the, the TV, you actually can be in the game, you know, it literally means that virtual reality. So it immerses you into a um, augmented environment or augmented reality. So, you know, using back the, the example, just now Resident Evil, right? So instead of you kind of like using your control to shoot these zombies, you are actually in the game. So I'm, I'm speaking from experience, so before that, this, I mean, I love to use this example, right? This person is shooting, so this is a corridor here. I mean, I wouldn't know there's a zombie here, right, when you're playing your Xbox or your, your PlayStation. But literally, when you're walking, the zombie will jump out and you go, wah, right? But right now, with VR, because it immerses you in the game, you literally can do this, you know, to see if there is a zombie hiding right behind that pillar. So you are literally being placed in the game. I mean, he's kind of smiling. I think you have tried it before, right? Resident Evil. I mean, I, I personally went to try Resident Evil VR in um, Sony PSVR. So Sony PSVR is just an example of a head-mounted display brand. So Sony also has their own VR goggle now, but it's mainly for gaming. So they are having Sometimes they, they do exhibitions, especially in Visma Atria, 
um, and you know if you are free and you want to know how that feels like go, go ahead go down there try on the goggle ask them to play you the Resident Evil game and you will know uh, what, what, I, what I mean about how you are literally in the game <coughs> so the second one sorry the number is a bit off but the second one is, is live events um, this was quite a boom reason being Say for example, Lady Gaga is having a concert in, in New York and of course you cannot really fly to New York because it's a bit costly and also not to mention tickets are always sold out after two hours. So how does all these record labels capture uh, this over subscription or over demand of the supply of these tickets, right? So what they do, of course, they would use virtual reality and apply it to this industry or situation. So what they do is now they capture on the fact that they can immerse you or bring you virtually into the concert they will start maybe to sell you virtual tickets okay so um, maybe for example the uh, Lady Gaga is under Universal Music for example is a record label that owns the rights of Lady Gaga songs I mean this is just an example right maybe Universal Music can create an app where consumers can download the app and start to purchase all these virtual tickets and then be able to watch the concert that's happening real time in New York. So I'm talking maybe now the concert is happening but I'm able to be there, you know, I'm able to even purchase VIP tickets that, you know, maybe four times or five times more the price if I were to really buy the tickets in person and, you know, it's being highly promoted now that the experience is almost the same when you wear the headgear and you're being immersed in the concert there. So this is just um, some of the examples for live events. And of course, the biggest, biggest demand now for live events is sports. So sports is like a billion dollar game. Like as you know, right, FIFA, Premier League. Tickets are really, really hard to get. And all these networks around the world are bidding just for the rights to add them on TV. So, you know, if you have been reading some news on football, I think last year where it was such a big deal that I think Starhub or, or some network couldn't stream or broadcast live some football matches and there was this uproar by all the fans. It is actually because it is actually very costly to purchase or buy the rights from these rights owners just to broadcast it to you guys. Because the tickets are so good, so so profitable for them that they actually limit the, the number of broadcast stations that they will sell or lease the rent the, the, the rights to. So that's just a bit of background, I'm not trying to cite any networks here in case you guys are also part of the, the complaints that why it's not being broadcast live. Uh, so then the third one is e-commerce. So anything to do with commerce is of course business, right? Uh, V-commerce is actually very interesting as well because you know how how do we profit or capitalize on bringing people virtually into another place and into another experience? So the third industry is such where, for example, uh, I own a vineyard that that harvest grapes and to make wine, right? So how do I sell more wine? I cannot, okay, of course there are marketing budget I can spend on to advertise my vineyard, you know, my wine. But on top of that now, I can actually let people see, although they are not in Australia, for example, they can see my vineyard. They can even taste and smell my, my wine, for example. So there are a couple of, um, restaurants already in the world around the world what they do is before before you buy a wine for example if the shop is selling a wine what they do is they will give you a taste taster but at the same time you can actually uh, wear the headgear and kind of be immersed into the environment say for example where all this wine was being produced you know, at the same time, of course, you're wearing, you're there, and then you kind of smell the wine. It's really as though you are, you, you are in the vineyard having wine tasting session, you know. So this is how businesses are capitalizing um, on, on the technology to grow 
their business. I mean, make more money means you grow your business, right? Because if you have more money, then you can kind of expand and do more things. Uh, restaurant F&B is one. Secondly, I saw as well in Plaza Singh, a travel agency that has a couple of headgears lying around. So what they are doing is, of course, travel agency, they are selling tour packages, right? But instead of giving you brochures now, you know, trying to, uh, trying to uh, sell you or trying to convince you for the next 30 minutes in terms of words that I can use to describe the place or the package that you're buying, instead now you can just go and wear it and you can see for yourself just how beautiful that place that you're thinking of going. So this is how different businesses are using the technology uh, to bring you into a virtual world. So that's the lead commerce over there. Okay, ads and sponsored content, just very simple. Um, so you do watch, there are plenty of uh, TVCs, uh, TV commercials around, be it on TV, be it on social media, right? Advertisements about Kit Kat, about Oreo, about Coke. So now because these brands like Coke, for example, um, know that there are a lot of talks about 360 VR. So it's almost like a fad, right, FAD, where, uh, I don't know if you know Cantonese, but I mean, we used to say a uh, new toilet bowl, right, if you, you have, if you bought something that is like a novelty, you will keep using it, right? So same thing for VR as well. Everyone is now talking about the VR. So all these brands, they don't want to lose up. They also want to jump into the game of VR. So they know that, say for example, you see a VR, you will, you will watch it. You will go, you will start to you know, move your phone around when you see a 360 video being played on Facebook. So all these brands like Coke, what they do is they spend more money um, to make advertisement in 360 VR or VAR even, right? So they are just so that's called ads and sponsored content, basically a content that is being paid for to advertise something. Okay, so uh, the next one, of course, entertainment and movies, TV like experiences. Um, I mean, if you have time or if you're just a little bit curious, uh, you can go Google uh, this little content, which is only 11 minutes. It's called Help, H-E-L-P. It is shot or produced by Google themselves um, when the technology took off. This is an 11-minute short film that is fully virtual reality. So it is a little bit about, it's like Godzilla, but do take a look at it. Uh, they, we are, I mean, if you ask me, I'm, I'm from a film's background, but if you ask me, VR will take entertainment really to the next level. So you're not even talking about going to the theatres next time anymore. You're talking about an immersive theatre, right? Where potentially you can even choose what you want to watch. So when I, when I say that, it really means, say for example, every movie has an ending. So imagine now, this, the technology is becoming so powerful, you can actually choose the ending that you want to watch. So literally, right, you are being placed with the characters. So instead of next time, say down the, down the road, years to come, instead of you watching um, Stormtroopers in Star Wars, you are actually part of Stormtroopers potentially. You know, kind of choo choosing what ending or what is the cause of storytelling that you want to be in already. I mean, another example which is which I thought again very interesting is so virtual reality content was actually partly made famous by this guy called Chris Milk. So Chris Milk is actually a philanthropist. So in 360 when you talk about uh, immersive experience, right? So Chris uh, actually went to shoot or produce a little film uh, on the Syrian refugee. Why? It's because he wanted to let all these beneficiaries know and all, all, all these guys that he's trying to fundraise for the ref refugee camp to kind of experience what it really feels like to be you know, in their shoes, you know, part of the refugees themselves. So how he did that is of course he went to produce a VR little film um, in partnership with uh, UNICEF. So the fundraise event was a huge success because it's also the first time that public gets to really feel and watch, you know, 
what it really feels like to be in their shoes. Uh, so we're talking about instead of an experience you're watching, it's more visceral. So visceral, I mean by you have you feeling what the characters are feeling more. You know, of course now when you watch in the movies, you are kind of into in, into it, right? So of course you will start to like tear or or like laugh. I mean, when the movie takes you through that range of emotions, but in three six in in VR. Because it immerses you in the environment that you're in, it's actually more powerful than what you are watching on, on screen. They are saying, okay, so again, why all this fat now? I mean, it's actually not just part of the town, right? It is actually being supported as well by data and figures. So, say for example, Facebook, they found out as well. Um, people that clicks onto a VR or 360 content on Facebook is actually four times more than normal video being uploaded. So when, of course, all these brands know about such um, a consumer trend, they themselves will jump on the wagon and want to produce more VR advertisements because they know that like, four times more people are watching my brand. You know? So again, why I'm sharing all these things is because hopefully you would kind of find a, a little bit here and there points which you find useful to apply to your current work today, you know. So seven is, the next point is communication like VR conference calls and meetings. Now again, same concept as you being in New York watching Lady Gaga concert. Now we're talking about conferences where you're having meetings with um, executives or colleagues from all around the world but now being placed into the same room and having a discussion in work. Now, Facebook is actually, has actually announced uh, VR Social. So VR Social is, I don't know if you watch um, a recent Mark Zuckerberg when he, start, he rolled out this feature, is in the years to come, he does foresee that if I am in this room here today, you guys and me will be avatars. So it is VR crossing into AR already. And if, it's, if we're talking about real time happening live, it's actually mixed reality. So all of us are avatars, all of us are all in different countries, but all of us at the same time is having a meeting in, a, in the same room. So that is the conference call meetings application. I mean, the second last one is training and education. Um, very, very relevant in e-commerce here today, especially, I mean in Singapore it's already happening, especially in the States and China. Simulation for training and education, very simple application. One example, um, if you're an architect, right? Historically, you used to spend hours building models, 3D models, just to present to clients. I do not know how long you spend on you know designing the models, how many times you have to go back and, and tweak it based on what clients' feedbacks are. But now just from a very simple tweak in your code or your software, you're able to project out your design. And literally if you use your hand like this, the building start to come up if it's being projected. So um, a couple of startups and a couple of companies have already tried to apply this technology on architectural industry here in Singapore today and they are actually already using it in also shipping. So shipping, they are trying to plan logistics. So how, you, how are they going to do all this? Is they, are, they are using VR and AR to kind of present to clients or present to their stakeholders where all these ships are moving to. So literally you can see like things moving around but it's all in computer generated graphics. Let's see what else. Okay, training. Um, again, we shot for, we had a project with um, the army once. So instead of them using live bullets, for example, simulating a training, say, um, in the camp or MMRC, right? What they do now is they are creating VR content for all these soldiers um, and, you know, shot off because they can save so much cost and not run that training in such a big scale, they just need to create a virtual environment for all these soldiers and all these trainees to wear and to train. So literally again, right, it's if this is a corridor, so they literally can wear the head here and walk 
and then kind of do this, you know, and then start to shoot. And it's actually all, all very accurate because it's all timed by quotes, right? So we're talking about, say, for example, if I'm in this room, um, uh, and I want the door to open, it's an enclosed space, right? I literally need to just, wearing the headgear, walk towards that direction. And once I do that because of the directional coding, once you head towards that, and then it will activate, say for example, this realm over here, and then it will transport you into another space, which essentially is you walking into the other room, for example. So, uh, I was, if you ask me today, uh, widely used cases are really in simulations for training and education today and, um, and live events. Uh, I'll, share, I'll share with you why later. Okay, the last one is tourism. Uh, so tourism, anything that enhances your experience, right? So tourism now is capturing on this. It's, so, uh, it's all about the experience, right? Uh, you have Say for example, uh, Changi. You know, Changi has stations. Actually, you'll be surprised. Changi, uh, sorry, uh, STV, Singapore Tourism Board. They don't not only having operations in Singapore, they have operations. I think mean, forty over offices in around the world. And what they do there is they sometimes will set up what they call a satellite locations in all these airports around the world. So what they do, of course, they are trying to capture more tourists to come to Singapore, right? So, but how how do they do that? is by showing all these tourists that they don't reside in Singapore, the experiences in Singapore. So I mean, all these satellite stations, for example, maybe tourists can wear these headgears and kind of see for themselves how Gardens by the Bay look like. So all these, again, a little bit similar to number five, the ads and the sponsored content. You know, anything to advertise. Okay, any questions thus far? Mm -hmm. Number nine, right? Yes. So according to the National Museum, recently, they work with a National Heritage Board that actually showcase all the past exhibits. Correct. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, so, good, good uh, example over there um, in Singapore and also in Berlin. So what they do is they want to try, they want to show people, uh, the millennials for example, or us, history about the country. So how do they do that? Of course, historically, they would flash artifacts or recreate all these instances on screen for you. But right now, you can actually project all these spaces out literally. So in, I didn't see the one in the National Gallery, but the use, cases that, the use case that I saw was in Berlin, where literally in the room, buildings, those old buildings were being projected out, you know where how this how historically this building came to be made for example while it is being constructed you can literally see you know through the projection how it was being built so this is how you know tourism has been used um, used on the technology itself the technology being used on the industry itself So do you have any question about some other kind of view? Okay, I, I, I don't want to go too much uh, into the technicals of how do you create such content, but I, I don't know if you are if you are keen to know how it's being shot or how is it being created. I mean feel free to let me know. I mean I'm happy to share it uh, with you. But I mean hopefully today's session today's sharing is again right to try to to think about how the technology can be used on on your daily on your daily work or even if you don't talk it don't think about it professionally if you have an idea say for example that you think maybe enhance using the technology I mean feel free to throw it out there uh, I mean to share with you so maybe a bit of a background uh, Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. So, my name is Ali. I'm from Beaver. So, Beaver is actually a uh, VR, com VR, AR company. Um, historically, we have been producing local feature films to support the, the local industry here. So, we have been around for the past like 22 years. Um, and 
I mean, he, he has his own face. Um, bird pictures use bird pictures is our we uh, our company that did uh, that does feature films. So early last year, we started to play around with our toys. Now maybe this is an experience that um, that you may find useful. You know, in terms of you have a lot of toys going on, or, or like if you already do shoot pictures around. Uh, so early last year, we were playing around with our existing cameras, existing rigs. Just out of curiosity, you know, a question, how do you shoot a 360 content? It's as simple as that, really. So we started to play around with our assets, um, building our own rigs, uh, kind of like, you know, using a few cameras. Sorry? Yes, It's nothing, yeah. Um, and, and then we found out how to, how to shoot 360 VR. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's something that is totally new. It's just, you know how it is sometimes you connect the dots, right? Um, or, or, if you, or if you have something, then what can you do to add on to it to be able to do something new? So it's really as simple as that. So we started to, to be able to shoot 360 VR. And it wasn't a commercial thing when it first started out. Uh, but you know, as timing has it as such, the technology boom, right? So we started to get inquiries about, you know, hey, can you guys shoot um, our, our, our showroom, you know, for example, a car wants to be launched, Audi wants to launch a new car. So hey, can you come and shoot, you know, in 360, our, our event space? I was like, sure, you know, so it, start, it really started off just as that, you know, a lot of testing, a lot of playing around, a lot of projects, I would say, to, to really then we started to see the potential of the technology. I mean, like mentioned, I personally do um, believe in where this will be headed. Of course, then now if you see a lot of data, uh, they are past like 21 billion, like Goldman Sachs figures for the next 10 years is 21 billion revenue growth, right? Um, so we will see if that will happen. Uh, but of course, you know, market is such when there is expectation, there is performance. It's always as simple as that. Even in share market, it's all prices are basically consumer expectations. So, I mean, of course, I'm in the business. Of course, I, I, I would say that there is a future or potential in this. So then, when we started to do more and more VR projects, you know, more and more like concerts and um, events, we started to get, of course, a lot of question about hey are you guys still do are you guys no longer producing films um, and it wasn't the case so what happened is we decided to you know be a bit more clear cut in terms of branding so we spun up our operations in VR into uh, Beaver or in short just Bird Entertainment VR um, and so Beaver just looks after any VR AR mixed reality content um, Bird Pictures still does feature films now, if you ask me, are they both entirely separated? It would be a clear no. It is just a different medium. Fundamentally, if you ask me, as a filmmaker, content is still content. So content is still king. So it doesn't matter if I create the next Beauty and the Beast, for example. These are just mediums that I present to consumers. So back to just now the first chart or first slide that I show you. Content, you fit into a system to augment it, you know, based on whatever medium that you want to produce it out to and then ultimately is to be consumed by the people. So again, fundamentally the content, if I create the next big Walt Disney, you know, through, either through bird pictures, you know, either through movies, it's just one medium. I can feed it to, to VR, I can feed it to mixed reality, but ultimately I think what would be quite um, important to note, uh, I believe, is to be to go back to fundamentals about the creation of the content. I mean, of course, a lot of people have um, different views about it, right? Maybe they want to develop the next big um, camera, for example, you know, or that can shoot a better VR experience. Or there are also groups that can develop better um, software systems to to enhance people's experiences. But if you think about, if there are no content out there, the, 
even if your headgear, for example, is like the best in the world, if there is no content, it's still a useless piece of thing. That is also going back to why VR has been around for the past 30 years, but it has never really taken off until this couple of years. Okay, I think I am finished for today. The time is just about right. So any questions that I can answer today? Yeah, of course. Then you'll be a big beard, right? So how does the uh, how do we have to get for like Google when they do their uh packaging and the VR thing is actually a stationary thing or we go to the higher package for the form of the so uh so that it it moves to that to take a so that is actually like kind of a static that is deep. So yep. so how does the thinking for VR like how is that a way to overcome this can. So again, uh, to answer your question, so um, our friend here has asked a question about you know when you shoot shoot a 360 VR environment because it's 360 you can see everything. Literally, how can I hide all of you? But I think what would be more interesting to tackle is going a few steps back about what is the point or what is the story of your content. So say for example, you want to shoot um, a refugee camp, but you want people to be in the shoes of one of the victims. So how do you shoot it? So which means your camera is actually the point of view of the character inside. So as a consumer, when I wear the headgear, I'm actually one of the victims in the Syrian refugee camp, right? So in terms of execution, there are a couple of ways to do it. So of course you can rig it on the head, you can like you mentioned hold the camera like this um, or for example you can rig it on a vehicle that is remote controlled with sta stabilizer for example, red technical stuff, bear with me. But um, then you can able to use movements and kind of mimicking a person that is walking, right? So how can you hide all these things? Again, it comes kind of, I wouldn't call it AR but it's actually more visual graphics already. So it's as simple as, for example, um, hiding the camera, because when you look down, you can see the camera stand, of course. It's as simple as hiding that using um, graphics. So like, for example, Google did a help. Uh, the short film help is like a Godzilla thing chasing the guy all over the train. How they shot, how they shoot it was they shot it in a green room. So when I say green room, it's not like 360 green room. What happened is they just use a camera and track the green. I mean, again, very technical stuff here, but it's very, very sim similar or if I would say the same application as when Hollywood shoot like lots of the rings, for example. So all these are computer generated images. So you literally use computer generated images to hide whatever you want to hide inside. So for the Syrian refugee one, it's fairly simple. Um, you literally do not need to be there at all. So. Um, depending on how you drive the story, for example, you can rig it on a person and you use computer graphics to hide that person. Or you can leave the camera static there and if you need to watch what's happening, um, you can do it two ways. Um, maybe to share a bit with you about my experiences. I have hidden under tables before, I have hidden behind the trees before, I have hidden anywhere uh, for, the sh for to shoot 360. Um, and that is way before now technology has advanced into you are able to actually have a wireless monitor now for the director. So now this is able, this, this, is, this is possible now. But if you're talking about like early last year when we started to shoot 360, um, me and the team, we have literally just hidden hide in any places that you can think of, like in the ditch or like wherever, just so that you're, you're out of camera sight. And it's actually a very difficult thing um, to direct a story, if you think about directing a story in 360 VR medium, it's actually relatively more difficult than directing on normal 2D. So this is just 2D, right, when you see on TV or on the movies. 
Reason being, there are a lot of elements now that you cannot control. So, historically, I can control, like you know, if I shoot a 2D here, this angle. I can control, say for example, there are birds flying around. I, can just, I did just need to make sure the bird, birds doesn't fly into my frame when I'm shooting this angle. But if you're talking about a 360 camera now, you literally cannot control it anything, right? The birds can be flying behind you, how are you going to control that? You can't, right? Um, so it is dif relatively more difficult, but at the same time, um, it's challenging in a good way because now imagine just how many things that can happen around you. You can, you can literally be directing a chase scene here, something can be happening there. So as, as a director or as a storyteller, of course the big question which is which, uh, which people will ask is how do you link all this together to create that immersive experience for your consumers? I hope that answers your question. Okay, so what else did I miss out? Yeah, so mainly with computer graphics that you can hide the things that you want to hide in your story. Um, aside from that, it's also how you link your stories or how you create your stories, for example. So it's a combination of both. So two things, right, when you shoot a 360 VR story that is good to know. One is you can either be it a point of view of your characters that you build your story around. Secondly, a third party person. So third party person is, I'm, so you are actually the camera now. So always think about, always think about this, right? You, you are the camera. So do you want to be part of the characters that the story is building around you? Or do you want to be like, for example, the travel buddy of the main character? Because it's all, it all will be scripted differently. It all will happen, actions will happen very differently as well. Any other questions? Feel free to throw it out since I'm here. Happy to take you through the process if you want to know. Do you have a question? How would the steps of the things are different? Good question. Um, very common question. Uh, so let's talk about 2D first. So historically, you conceptualize a story, right? You think about what you want to sh what what you want to tell. So that's the fundamental content that you think about. So secondly, after which, then we will all prepare and go and shoot that story that you have conceptualized. After which, when you shoot, then you will edit. So what we call post-production already. So in post-production process, you cut or rather you edit and piece your stories together or your shots together. And then after which, of course, then you will maybe put special effects on it, um, do audio, compose music, and then you distribute, or rather you, you distribute either on social media or in the theatres, right? So remember, capture, um, post, okay, conceptualize, capture, capture, post-production, distribution, okay, rule of thumb. For 360 VR, it works a bit differently in the sense that, of course, when you can conceptualize, there are, of course, going to be conceptualization. Second is uh, you will capture. Now, the difference comes in this stage where instead of going to post-production, when you edit and you cut and you put music, you actually stitch your images together. So um, some cameras, they auto-stitch. But most of the time, honestly, you have to manually stitch yourself. When I say stitch, is for example, historically, you are only shooting 2D, right? So now, imagine you are shooting the whole room. So you're literally stitching this part, this part up below and right, stitching all together into a sphere. It's actually a ball, you know? Um, and there are specific softwares that are able to support editing of all these spheres images. Then after which, again, same process, going through post-production, and then you distribute. So now, now these days, more and more platforms are able to support 360 VR. So in terms of distribution, uh, I think there are no problem. You can upload it on YouTube, you can upload it on Facebook, and even Twitter, soon to come, will have that feature as well. Hope that answers your question. Yes. So the difference comes in is you need to stitch your images together. 
Any more questions? Again, um, as of last month, I think there are I think two cinemas in China that has launched and and it's called the VR cinema of the next generation. So how they do that, how they apply this technology is like our friend here mentioned. There are limited seats, not as many as 80 now that you see in the cinemas, but maybe I think talking about maybe 20, and then they will rig a headset onto the seat. And what is interesting is actually all these seats are a bit um, interactive or movable. So say for example you're watching Game of Thrones and you are being thrown into the lift and the lift kind of like falls into the cliff, right? And then when that happens, the seat actually is able to simulate with the content itself. So I think, if, I don't know if you have seen a couple of examples where um, um, like VR roller coasters, right? So they are, they are starting to break um, head mounted displays on roller coasters to instead of you experiencing the ride now, you are actually being placed into like a Disney World and riding the roller coaster. But and it is actually coded in such a way it is um, linked or, or synchronized with the content in your headgear. Now the idea, I mean, fantastic, right? If you ask me, in terms of cinema next time, how this will advance into? I mean, this is just a personal opinion. I feel that until the headgears advance in such a stage where you don't need to wear them purposely just to experience such content, I think that is when VR will truly take off. Because imagine now if you think about if you're wearing glasses, just one tap of a button you're able to activate and start to watch VR. I mean, this sounds like minority like report, right? Um, minority report, the futuristic movie, but Google is actually in the process of developing such a thing. It's called Google Glass. Um, it is now, the operation is kind of halted for a bit, but you know, Microsoft has jumped in on hollow, hollow glasses. Um, and even, for example, the, the guys, the, the company that is developed, was helping develop um, windscreen GPS. Now it's trying to experiment, see how they can apply that technology towards your glasses. Because essentially, it's actually the same thing if you think about it. If next time in the future, of course, um, next time, of course now it's already happening, Uber is already experimenting how to develop cars without drivers, driverless cars, right, they are talking about. They are also developing how they can activate your GPS system into your windscreen. So it's really one button next time you're able to follow uh, wherever it's being projected. Actually, if you think about it, it's exact application as if in a 360 environment. Because you turn left, turn right, wherever, go down bumps and stuff, is, is a sphere. So how do we lift that technology off your glasses in the future? That would be quite interesting to watch. I hope that answers the question. Or more sharing. You know, if you guys have any ideas that how this technology can be applied to something that has never been done before, I mean, feel free to share. Uh, I guess that's where ideas come from. And of course, another big thing that everybody is talking about now is how do we monetize 360 content, right? Because historically, how do we monetize 2D content in such where they will they will sell ad space, they will let. Um, a brand advertise their website on it or something like that. But on a 360 space, how do you control people? You know, if you put your branding there, people may be looking this side. So this is something that they have not cracked yet. So of course, a lot of platforms now are offering 360 content for free. But there will be one day, for example, if someone has cracked this, how do you monetize such content? Then I think this would be quite interesting to watch as well. Cool. Any other questions? No need to be shy, just throw it out. Or if you are shy and you want to talk like probably also can later. Uh, no questions? Is there any uh, 
software you recommend for stitching 360 photos? Three, okay, so I thought Holo was quite, video stitch was quite easy to use. Um, but of course, if you want to go a step further in terms of um, uh, resolution, I would recommend uh, auto panel. Uh, but having said that, just recently, Adobe has launched um, the entire suite of software that is VR enabled. So you're talking about a full spectrum of being ex being able to export and import all your files in Adobe itself. So check it out. Yeah. Maybe later uh, you can share the links on the Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Adobe is the next big thing. I was just launched a couple of weeks back from here, or months back, sorry, yeah. So, um, another thing to note, I mean, in terms of technical, um, now, if you're talking about rendering or being able to to edit 2D last time, now if you're talking about sphere, which is everywhere, of course, your CPU speed has to be enough, uh, especially your video, video card, video graphics card has to be high enough to be able to render so many realms and so that it doesn't crash your computer as well. Yeah. Cool stuff. Do you need a special kind of You do? Uh, yes and no. So right now, of course, with $300 or $400, you're able to get a, 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 a small camera that is able to shoot 360, both pictures and video. Now, if you're talking about um, sports events that these networks have paid a lot of money for. Um, then there are also a lot of cameras out there that, that are proprietary. So for example, maybe I love to shoot a film with a red camera. So a red camera is typically used to shoot films because it can go up to 8K. 8K is a resolution, right? It's even cinema now only support like up to 4K, for example. So how these people has been kind of experimenting how to shoot the rig cameras is they they build a rig themselves to be to line up these cameras like this. So depending on how many cameras you want to power, you can tow from three to all the way to eight cameras depending on on your rig. You can just build the rig and you know kind of experiment with with that. So yes and no, you can literally go out to Samsung and buy they call the Samsung 360 ball. Um, or of course, if you are shooting uh, professional films in VR for, for clients, then I would say are those more high-tech cameras out there. So who are some of your clients that you do? Um, for 360? Like, or anything Okay, so for VR now, again, very widely applied in, in simulations training and education. So a lot of government projects that we are doing for, for soldier simulation, for even sing power, for example. Now for brands, it's, you know, like the brands, the usual, WPPs. Um, we recently, I mean, we did NDP last year, um, and we're doing C Games coming up, where, again, similar concepts to the live events. C Games, how can people watch C Games if they are not in Malaysia this year, for example? So what we're doing is we are live streaming, in 360 so people can if they want to choose to watch C games at home they can now live real time yeah so that's just um, one of the applications I mean if you ask me what is more fun I would say is uh, stories that you create conceptualize and how do you create um, story based advertisements I think that is more interesting I mean this is a personal thing right but of course some people prefer just to live stream um, 360 VR because it's a lot easier if you ask me. Um, you, the process is also a lot easier for live streaming. Very technical stuff, bear with me. Uh, that's about it. But yeah, feel free to think about um, how it can be used, on what. Um, how can, I don't know, any pain points you're having and maybe you could think about how if I can use this technology, would it make my life easier? So, something to think about. I mean, Linus will be sharing stuff online, I guess. I don't know.
yeah, we, we, we don't have internet here. I mean, we would love to show you some VR 360 videos and stuff, but if it's going to be quite hard on the mobile and then we try to get the... Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't use your data to watch a 360 video on YouTube because you're talking about four to six times more power you need just to watch, you know? Not to mention the data as well. Yeah, you just need maybe an hour of watching throughout the day and that's it. You will pass for the month. I did it once and then you can literally check the data and see a spike there. It's, it's madness. Um, it's really madness. Um, and also, I mean, something that's interesting now that you have brought it up is when you watch a 360 content on YouTube with Wi-Fi, you are able to see and select your resolution. So okay, you can go all the way up to like 4K now, 2140 resolution, which is the max. Um, but you will find that your battery will be like crazy, right? It will deplete your battery. Uh, but that's again why that feature is not there if you're on data. Because it will just bust bust your data. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe I just, I just want to round off uh, this session here. I mean, thank you very much for having uh, for coming to share with us uh, on the VR360 content. Uh, the reason why I brought her in is because, you know, uh, we've done the VR session before, but, you know, but she's truly somebody who has actually been there, done that, and you know, shot uh, actual content for VR360 before. Uh, people like myself, we really are doing that for research purposes, you know, but not on the application side of it. Uh, but maybe, uh, and one of the points I think she mentioned that was, uh, I think is quite interesting is that you know, uh, the VR content on social media is actually viewed four times more than uh, by, by viewers than regular content. So, uh, what the purpose of this talk right, is actually to try to uh, bring about some kind of empowerment for you guys. Whether you, how many of you here are sort of like business owners or trying to use this maybe in the kind of business that you do or the kind of uh, activities, I don't know, maybe church or the kind of uh, or any freelancers here in this industry, you know, who's trying try to get into this area, you know, that this is an exciting area, you know, I want to try to, you know, trying to get into this area. I'm not trying to think, um, it's been around for quite a while, right? Even most of us are thinking about the majority. Right. Not so as global as you know, because of the consumer and the market size, you know, the volume. We love about China, so we do, right? They have really been doing most of the time, uh, they have used mm -hmm. for eight years, really, for their Okay. So, why it's not here also is another reason of budget. Mm -hmm. So if, even if I were to do this for a it would be someone that can afford a larger scale overseas mm -hmm. rather than a local production company. Right, right. Okay. So, um, yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, I've done, you know, I, I work for Singapore Polytechnic. So what I've done is that I've, I've actually teamed up uh, with uh, Ellie and Bieber, and I, and I noticed a lot of technical questions uh, coming from the floor. You know, most of you are sort of curious, you know, how is this done? I want to do it myself. So what we've done is that we have actually come up with an entry level course, you know, for uh, for those of you who are interested to actually do it yourself. You know, going there, uh, the, the you all you need to do is just bring a phone, and we'll provide the cameras, we'll provide the equipment to all this, so that if you're unsure, you know, I've I've actually posted the link because uh, I don't have internet here, so I put it onto the Facebook our Facebook page. Uh, the the course site, the course link is already up. Uh, so uh, the good news is that I've actually managed to apply for the Skills Future Fund for this. So for those of you who have not spent your five hundred dollars, you know, you can actually use the Skills Future Fund for this. Uh, we are also in the process of applying for six degrees program. If you guys are aware of this, six degrees programs for freelancers, and you can actually get up to possibly ninety percent of the the, the the cost of the course. You know, so uh, yeah. So we're going to launch it, and the, the, it's going to be uh, in on August the twenty sixth, right? August twenty sixth, and September the second. Uh, that's the the date. So it's going to be over two Saturdays because we realize that people are usually working during that. It's going to be a full day course uh, over two Saturdays. So if you guys uh, have a moment, you know, feel free to check out the course. You know, um, we I, I believe that we are the first uh, polytechnic that's also doing this. Uh, so we're we're just going to try it out and see see what, what the the whole purpose of this is just so that you know if you're if you're a small business owner or if you just want to if you've already been creating content, and you want to try to try this new area and, and see if it can help to improve your business or your workflow, you know, uh, yeah, something for you to think about, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks, for, thank, uh, thanks for coming today, as usual. Uh, our next session will be on the second Tuesday of uh, September. So maybe I could add on a yes, bit. Yes, please. Um, 
I mean, Singapore context, again, uh, as you mentioned, very true, it's a very small market. It doesn't only apply to, of course, we are, we are. It also applies to films as well. Because, again, a chicken and egg thing, right? If your market size is not big enough, of course, the suppliers are not out there. But if, I mean, there is something to take away, I would say to try to target companies with regional operations that is based off Singapore, for example. Like, um, banks or even some advertising firms now, they are their regional headquarters is actually in Singapore, but that doesn't mean that they do not shoot or create content that is out of Singapore. So maybe, we, you know, you guys, if there's something useful, maybe you can look into that as well. I mean, try to go, they always say try to go bigger, uh, which is actually very true. I mean, try not to create content that is only uh, able to be consumed by local market, you know. Try not to, to, to um, to create uh, like Hokkien stuff, for example, because it's only for local market, right? Of course, if you want to um, grow the local industry or support the local industry, by all means, because we've been doing that for years, creating local content. But it's actually uh, what is different. It's a different thing that we are doing, actually, right? So, I mean, if you're looking to commercialize your businesses or your work, I mean, something that you can think about target elsewhere, but there's always a regional headquarter in Singapore. Okay, that's all. I mean, feel free to ask questions or drop me a Facebook message or whatever.